Bible long enough, and if you are around verse by verse preaching of the text of Scripture long enough, you will likely be afforded many opportunities for amazement. I think that has been happening. I think by God's grace that will continue to happen. Sometimes that amazement comes from seeing a passage that you once thought meant a certain thing, but then when you see it in its proper context, you realize that it means something different than what you thought, and you're like, wow, the Word of God is, the Word of God is amazing. I never saw that before. Sometimes it may be we're walking verse by verse through the Gospel of Luke, for instance, and you find that the Word of God was so timely for where you were at in life on that particular morning. And many times I think what you will see that leads to your amazement is the way the Scripture in so many ways points to Jesus Christ. And just the different ways in which that happens causes your mind to say, the Word of God is amazing because it's helping me to see more clearly the Word of God incarnate. Because it's pointing to Him over and over again. You may see a fresh disclosure, for example, of the wisdom and power of God as you see the convergence of so many Old Testament prophecies found to be fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amazing. Throughout the Old Testament, there are many prophecies of the Messiah, some of which deal with His first coming, others of which deal with His second coming. Concerning His first coming, such prophecies include Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, told us that He would be born of the tribe of Judah. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, help us to see that He would be born of the line of David. Micah chapter 5, verse 2, tells us that He would be born in Bethlehem, not to mention the fact that His goings forth, His origin would would be from everlasting. So the child that was born in Bethlehem had an origin that far preceded Bethlehem. It was from everlasting. In Psalm 41, verse 9, we see that he'd be betrayed by a friend. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, we see that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. In Isaiah, 5, Isaiah 53, we see that he would be spat upon, smitten, and scourged. Verse 5, buried with the rich. Verse 9, and executed with criminals. Verse 12, And the list could go on and on. And if it did go on, eventually you would come to Psalm 22. An amazing prophetic witness of the Son of God. So as to frame how amazing this prophecy is, let me briefly make a parallel with another portion of Scripture. Some of you may remember the name King Cyrus. Cyrus was a Persian king who in 537 B.C., after 70 years of exile, allowed the Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Now what's amazing about Cyrus is that about approximately, give or take, 150 years before the time that he would even be king, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, there are other places where he's mentioned, but you could look there for one instance, called Cyrus by name. 150 years before he would even come on the world stage. Now, if you think that's amazing, consider this. David is writing this psalm, the psalm of the cross, if you will, not 150 years before the time of Christ and before his crucifixion, about a thousand years. And when you go through this psalm, in many ways it functions as an internal eyewitness account of the sufferings of the cross. If Isaiah 53 prophetically acts as a kind of external witness of the sufferings of Christ, Psalm 22 acts as an internal witness of the sufferings of Christ. So you'll see as we study through this psalm that it seems to be that the Son of God is speaking prophetically through David. But we'll see that as we get there. Um, I think you'll be pretty amazed as we go through this psalm. First, by way of reminder, this follows up on last week, a, a brief psalm reading reminder. So when you come into the Psalms, you want to have at least three things going on in your mind. The first thing I recommend to you would be something like this. You want to see the context. You want to ask the question, what is the psalmist's situation? Sometimes that's easier than others. You look at Psalm 3, for instance. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. That gives you the context. You know to go to 2 Samuel chapter 13, and you start reading the Absalom narrative, and you can understand some of the variables historically that were going on there. Other times, it's a little bit more difficult. We saw a little bit of that in Psalm 16 last week. So that's one of the things you want to look at. Can I 
gather an understanding of the historical context of the psalm. Number two, you want to be on the lookout for where Jesus is referenced or where Jesus is speaking in the psalm. When Jesus was resurrected while he was on the road to Emmaus, he spoke to his disciples on the road, some of them, and he said, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Luke 24, verse 44. So sometimes the best way to discern whether or not a specific psalm is talking about Jesus is to see if there's a New Testament passage that applies the psalm to him. For example, when Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 18, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats his bread with me has lifted his heel against me. Well, the scripture that was fulfilled in that moment was Psalm 41, verse 9. So David's actual betrayal by a familiar friend, some believe to be Ahithophel, pointed beyond David to Christ. So that's one of the ways in which you want to see if a psalm is pointing to Jesus. Number three, remember that the psalm was a congregational song. So where appropriate, you always want to remember that the psalms were meant to be sung by the nation of Israel. So for example, when David said, I waited patiently for Yahweh, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me out of a horrible pit and out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock and put a new song in my mouth. The people of God were meant to think then, even as the people of God are meant to think now, that's not just David's song. The Lord, He lifted me up out of a miry pit. He saved me from my sin and He took me out of the muck and the mire of the world. This is my song too. So now granted, all three of these things are not necessarily happening in every verse of every psalm. But nonetheless, principally speaking, these are three things you want to be on the lookout for as you go through the Psalter. So with that in mind, we make our way to the subscript of Psalm 22 and it reads, To the chief musician... Set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. So when David wrote this psalm, he wrote it as he did other psalms, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You can reference Matthew twenty-two forty-three 43 as a witness to that. And let us remember that David did not only write as a man and as a king and as a psalmist, but he wrote as a prophet. Acts chapter 2 verse 30. That's important to remember because there are portions of this psalm that we can look at and say, okay, I think this relates to David, but there are undoubtedly portions of this psalm that point well beyond David, very clearly beyond David. You'll see that as we go through it. So a little side note, you'll hear me referencing the possible context for David, but then you'll hear me reference the more pertinent and particular context of Christ especially where that is um, clear. Now, concerning the subscript, David wrote this under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He gives it to the chief musician, and it was set to the deer of the dawn. I don't know what that sounds like. I wish I could hop on the guitar and show you. And this is what the deer of the dawn sounded like. And we don't know. We'll wait and then, you know, we'll get to hear it, I assume, in the new kingdom, in the new heavens and the new earth. But right now I can't say much more about that. It was clearly a specific musical designation and an arrangement. And we don't really know much else about it. So that's the subscript. Which leads us to the opening verse of our text this morning. Psalm 22, verse 1, where we read... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? So presumably, David was speaking about a time in which he felt forsaken by God. Even a man after God's own heart had times when he felt like God's face was hidden. And when those feelings were expressed and poured out in spirit-inspired psalms, those psalms are typically identified as psalms of lament. Psalms of lament. The interesting thing about psalms of lament is that although they typically begin in a place of lamentation, they typically end in a place of praise. Psalm 13 is a microcosm of this. 
It is six verses long. And in the first two verses, David is asking four questions, two of which are these. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? So it starts off in that place. And then in verse 3, we see a petition along with a little bit of argumentation. We see the same thing in verse 4. So verses 1 and 2, how long, how long, how long, O Lord? Verse 3, petition with a little bit of argumentation, a little bit more argumentation. And then by the time you get to verse 5 and 6, you read this. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. You read that short little psalm and you see quite a transition between verses 1 and 2 and verses 5 and 6. Psalms of lament typically work like that. And Psalm 22, though a messianic psalm, in many ways is a psalm of lament and it works like that as well. From verse 1 through 21, at least the first half of 21, this could be described as a psalm of lament. But then when you get to the second half of verse 21, you see the words, You have answered me. And the tone shifts in verses 22 through 31 to what essentially is a call of God's praise and declaration of it as well. So now with that truth in view, these words of David clearly go beyond David, seeing as they were quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. As he hung upon the cross, darkness had covered the land from about the sixth hour till the ninth hour, Matthew 27, verse 45. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So you look at the Gospel accounts, Jesus was on the cross from about 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And about about 12 p.m., the sky goes dark at the sixth hour. And you're still up on the cross till the ninth hour, which was 3 p.m. And it's at the ninth hour that he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus quote Psalm 22, verse 1? What is going on there? He knew what was coming. He knew that the Good Shepherd was going to lay down His life for the sheep. John chapter 10, verse 11. He knew that the Son of Man was going the way it was written about Him. Matthew chapter 26, verse 24. He knew that He came to give His life as a ransom for many. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He prayed that the cup that he had to drink would be removed from him if the Father were willing. Luke 22, verse 44, 42. And we know in light of many Old Testament scriptures that that cup represented the cup of God's wrath. And he knew it was coming. Even earlier in his ministry, Jesus had said that he had a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed and how stressed he was until it was accomplished. That baptism was a baptism of suffering that he was speaking about in Luke chapter 12, verse 50. So he knew this didn't take him by surprise. It wasn't like the cross was plan B. The cross was always plan A. So the question is, why is Jesus on the cross quoting Psalm 22, verse 1, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting that verse because in that moment, Psalm 22, verse 1 was being fulfilled. That's why he's quoting that verse. Paul said that he, speaking about the Father, made him who knew no sin, speaking about Jesus, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. According to Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. That's what's happening on the cross. Christ was being made a curse for us, bearing the curse of the law. Because remember the law said, Cursed is every man who does not continue in all things written in the book of the law to do them. So every man who hasn't fulfilled the law perfectly is under a curse. Not a voodoo kind of curse, but the judgment of God kind of curse. And Christ is standing there as a sacrificial substitute, as it were, on the cross for us, being made a curse for us. So while there is ontological continuity, meaning the Son of God was still the Son of God, 
He didn't stop for a moment having any kind of discontinuity ontologically by way of his being with the Father and the Spirit. There was no disconnect as it relates to his being. But there was, for the first time, a moment of relational discontinuity, a temporary cessation of relational communion between the Father and the Son as Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's showing us via that cry of disorientation that He is bearing the wrath and the deserved forsakenness of all who would be forgiven. That's why he's crying that out on the cross in Psalm 22, quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. Now consider two important implications of that. Number one, Jesus cried those words out so you would never have to. You may go through times when you feel like there is a cloud veiling the face of God as it were. But you never, ever have a right to say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because the same one who cried that out on the cross is the same one who said to you, Never will I leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, verse 5. So he was forsaken so that you would never be. And if you ever feel that you are, it is not accurate if you have repented of your sins and placed your trust in the person and work of Christ alone for forgiveness. Secondly, consider the magnitude of the sacrifice of the Father and the Son. For all of eternity. That's like longer than a zillion years. <laughs> a zillion years times a zillion years. And it's so much longer than that. The Father and Son and the Holy Spirit were joined together in this perfect communion of love for all of eternity. And then the Father, in the fullness of time, would send forth His Son into the world, knowing that the time would come when His Son would lay down His life for sinners like us on the cross. And that would mean a temporary cessation of the communion that had been enjoyed for all of eternity, at least in some measure. What manner of love is this? No wonder why Romans chapter 5, verse 8 would say that God demonstrated His love for us on the cross. Nothing you or I could ever experience could come close to what the cross cost the Father and the Son. There was no higher sacrifice than the Father forsaking the Son. And there was no higher sacrifice than for the Son to have been forsaken by the Father. Amazing. It's with that in mind now as we approach verses 2 through 5. We can learn some lessons about what to do when it seems like God is silent. Verse 2. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. So after writing, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In verse 1, the psalmist continued to cry out, Oh my God, in the beginning of verse 2. This is important because although David is experiencing some measure of forsakenness, you could tell he's still crying out to God in faith. Still calls God and addresses God as my God. And by virtue of that cry, he is verbally affirming his faith in Yahweh. Now when David wrote, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, am not silent. The expression denotes that the cries were continuous. So like the Psalm 1 man who meditates upon the Word of God both day and night, David is saying here and implying here, I was crying out both day and night. Now as applicable to Jesus, we know that Jesus did not just cry out to God when He was on the cross. We know that He prayed when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know according to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, during the days of His flesh, He offered prayers and supplications with tears to the One who was able to save Him from death. And presumably, He prayed without ceasing, even as we are told to pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. David told God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. Well, that doesn't mean that God did not literally hear David. The all-knowing, ever-present God certainly heard David. But the expression here is often akin to answering in a positive way. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, for example, says, If we ask anything according to His will, 
He hears us. That doesn't mean that if we ask what is according to God's will, then all of a sudden the you know, volume is turned up and He can hear what we're saying. It's another way of saying He will answer in the affirmative. There's a lesson to be learned here in the example of both David and Christ. Although there was a sense of silence, a sense of silence in response to their prayers, what did they do? They continued to pray. Day and night. Here then is set forth for us an example of persistent prayer. So even if your prayers seem to go unanswered, what are you supposed to do? Keep praying. So granted, in the lives of fallen men and fallen women, there may be other variables that are going on. There may be unconfessed sin. There may be asking according to wrong motives. Those may be other variables that are happening in a moment. But provided those things aren't happening and you don't know of any other reason why certain prayers aren't happening and why deliverance isn't coming, resist being dejected and despondent and simply keep praying. Remember, just because you feel like God is not hearing you, just because you feel like God is not hearing you does not give you warrant to stop talking to Him. You can see that example through David and perhaps prophetically through Christ as well. And then when you keep praying and you do what the psalmist did in verses 3 through 5, we read, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. So David first affirms God's holiness. Another important thing to do when God seems distant and silent. You affirm God is holy. He said, but you are holy. The beginning of verse 3. It's as though he was saying, regardless of what happens to me, regardless of what I feel, the problem is not with you. You are holy. You are holy. We're reminded of the words of Job. Job 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, Yet will I trust Him. This declaration has that kind of ring to it, although here, despite feeling as though His prayers were not being heard, the suffering servant was in no way disposed to blaming God. David wrote that God is holy and appropriately, we're told, enthroned in the praises of Israel. So I think the psalmist is not only stating a poetic reality at this moment, but he's indicating or implying that God is in fact worthy of praise even in the midst of what he's going through. And then he looked back to what God had done in the past. We read, Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. Notice the pronoun emphasis there. They trusted you. They looked to you. Notice the emphasis on trust as well. Three times the text says, They or the fathers trusted in the Lord. This should serve as a reminder for the people of God that it's not only applicable to David as a suffering servant or to Jesus as the capital S suffering servant, the suffering redeemer, but to God's people throughout the ages that we can and we ought to look back at the way in which God has brought deliverance for His people over and over again. So with that being said, I want to make a bold statement and then define what I'm saying biblically. God's people are to cry out to God and look to past deliverances to see what God has done. Namely, of course, most particularly those that are found in the Scriptures. And to say, God, you delivered them and you delivered him and you delivered her and the people of God are to have full, full confidence that they will be delivered. Now I'll explain what I mean by that. I think it should be the premise of every son or daughter of God to understand that deliverance for them if they are son and daughter of God, is guaranteed. And the question is, what do you mean by deliverance? Deliverance can mean a change in what we define as unfavorable circumstances. It can be that, but deliverance is not relegated to simply a change of our circumstances in the way that we would like. Deliverance, biblically, can be better defined as being preserved faithful even to the point of death. That is the biblical essence of what deliverance is. It can be a change of circumstances and you got me out of the muck and the miry clay. But biblically speaking, it can also be defined as being preserved faithful even to the point of death. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 4, after Paul had noted in verse 6 that the time of his departure was at hand, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, the time of my departure is at hand, i.e., I'm about to die. And according to history, it appears that he would be beheaded under the jurisdiction and the government of the Roman Emperor Nero. And this was the moment he was on the brink of that. But then you come to verse 18, where he says these words, And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for His heavenly kingdom. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. To which you might say, wait a minute, Paul. You just said in verse 6 that you were about to die. So what do you mean that God is going to deliver you from every evil work? He tells us what he means by that in the second half of the verse. The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. Deliverance then is not only an escape from circumstances, but the ultimate reality of being preserved in circumstances. To be faithful to Christ, even to the point of death. And every son or daughter of God can look at God's past deliverances and know deliverance is coming. It may mean a change of circumstances, praise God. But I'm assured that He will preserve me faithful even to the point of death. He goes on in verse 6 and he says, But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. This is powerful language. I am a worm, no man, a reproach, and despised. By calling himself a worm and not a man, David is identifying himself as an object of weakness and scorn, one that was beneath the attention of men, and one that was easily trodden under the foot of men. Now, think of how amazing this is to apply this to Jesus. Now, the reason why I'm saying that, an important parenthetical note here, when you see the first person language that is used in the rest of the psalm, unmistakably, we see Jesus speaking through David. So I think it's appropriate at times to say, how would this apply to Jesus? Warren Wearsby had called this the forgotten I am statement of Jesus. You know the I am statements of Jesus? I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the light of the world. I am the vine. I am the resurrection and the life. Here's a forgotten one, perhaps, as he speaks prophetically through David. But I am a worm. Think about this. The one who had stood before the religious leaders and said, before Abraham was, I am. A statement that would make their jaws drop, proverbially speaking, because he was claiming himself to be the eternally existent God. Now, prophetically speaking through David, saying, I am a worm. This kind of statement should make the people of God fall to the ground in worship and adoration, saying, what kind of love is this that the Son of God would suffer such humiliation for a sinner like me? And the Hebrew word that is used here for worm in Psalm 22, verse 6 is tolath. According to many, many, many commentators, it is a very interesting word, and indeed it is. Because this word is translated as worm here in Psalm 22, verse 6. But if you go over to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it is translated as crimson. But then if you go into the book of Exodus, and you look at Exodus 25, verse 4, Exodus 26, verse 1, 26, 31, 26, 36, and many more, you see that it refers to scarlet thread. So why is this Hebrew word toloth, in one point translated as worm, another point translated as crimson, another point relates to scarlet thread? What you come to find is that this word, the Hebrew word that is used here, is used by a host of writers. It's a word tola and the root of it, and it refers to a specific kind of worm known as the cocos elysis. And the cocos elysis was a worm through which scarlet dye would be produced. This worm is a very interesting worm. Henry Morris, he speaks about this worm and he identifies it as the scarlet worm because it was commonly used in Israel to make dye. But it's also interesting to note the process that the worm underwent to bring about the scarlet dye and the possible, possible parallel between its actions and the Messiah. So listen to this excerpt from Henry Morris in his writing, Biblical Basis for Modern Science. He says, and I quote, 
When the female of the scarlet worm species was ready to give birth to her young, she would attach her body to the trunk of a tree, fixing herself so firmly and permanently that she would never leave again. The eggs deposited beneath her body were thus protected until the larvae were hatched and able to enter their own life cycle. As the mother died, the crimson fluid stained her body and the surrounding wood. From the dead bodies of such scarlet worms, the commercial scarlet dyes of antiquity were extracted. What a picture this gives of Christ, dying on a tree, shedding his precious blood, that he might bring many sons to glory. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. So perhaps such significance was in the mind of God when that particular identification was chosen. Perhaps. But the Messiah was not only regarded as a worm, we're told as a reproach of men and despised by the people. Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, verse 3, that Jesus would be despised and rejected by men. And in verses 7 and 8, we see an example of the reproach and derision that the Messiah experienced. Verses 7 and 8 read, All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. These verses not only articulate what the people did when Jesus was on the cross, but exactly what they said when Jesus was crucified about a thousand years later. This is incredible. About a thousand years before the very people were even born who would say these things, it's recorded in Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8. In Matthew's Gospel account, we read in Matthew 27, 39, and then subsequently I'm going to quote verse 43, we read these words. And those who passed by blasphemed Him, wagging their heads. Even as we're told that they shake their heads here in Psalm 22, verse 7. Going on, quoting further, He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Now, that kind of parallel should make us do a double take and marvel at the accuracy of biblical prophecy, of words written about a thousand years before they ever happened, yet describing what people would be doing and what people would be saying when Jesus was on the cross. Amazing. You're going to see things like that over and over again in the psalm, and you can't help but think it's messianic and that the Son of God is speaking through David. But again, before moving past these verses, we ought to take notice not only of their prophetic significance, but yet another aspect of our Savior's sufferings is put on display. Notice Jesus' trust was mocked, and God's delight in Jesus was questioned. We shouldn't be surprised then if during the course of our lives, people mock our trust in God during times of hardships and question whether or not God is so well disposed to us as we presumed Him to be in the Gospel. So if you ever find yourself on the receiving end of persecution that mocks you for trusting God, saying, I thought God loves you so much, right? I thought He sent His Son to die for you. Then how come you're going through what you're going through? And maybe it's not even somebody else who's saying that. Maybe that arises out from your own flesh. It's good to remember that the Son of God knows what it's like to be on the receiving end of such verbal assaults. Let us take a cue from this psalm and not dwell on the words of our persecutors, but rather turn our attention, even as the psalmist and the Messiah do, in verses 9 through 11. We read, But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. So the psalmist David, more explicitly the Messiah, turned attention to divine favor that was enjoyed from the mother's womb. The enemies mocked in the prior verse, verse 8, saying, Let God deliver him since he delights in him. And it was as though... The Messiah was recalling how true that was. God has delighted in me. God has been favorable towards me. Like Jeremiah, who was set apart to be a prophet to the nations, 
from before he was born, Jeremiah 1.5, or the Apostle Paul who was separated from his mother's womb, Galatians 1.15, David, and by extension the Messiah, call to remembrance the divine favor that they enjoyed from Yahweh in the earliest stages of infancy. And you'll notice that such a reality doesn't leave them unaffected. Rather, it is fuel for prayer and hope in the midst of affliction. It's as though the psalmist is looking back to the past and praying in the present and saying, in those times of my life when I was unprotected and defenseless, you took me and you made me trust. Therefore, in light of what you did then, be not far from me now. Interpose and rescue me. Kind of the implication contextually of what's going on here. I think it's also worth pondering the possibility that from the Messiah's perspective, this relates to his unique conception by which he became flesh and dwelt among us. There is a possibility that the Messiah speaking prophetically and recalling the earliest times of his incarnation. Amazing to consider. But again, let us remember the prophetic scene of the psalm. What was it? It was the cross. This is a psalm of the cross because the words that are uttered in this psalm take place about a thousand years later at the cross. So when we read in verse 11, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. We could see how that would be the Messiah's sentiment. When Jesus was arrested in Matthew 26, verse 56, all of his disciples fled. And we know that around the cross there was Mary, some of the other women, the Apostle John. But at the end of the day, no one could help. Not only because Jesus was the only one who could be the wrath-absorbing sin-bearer, but also because of the enemies and the hostile forces that were gathered around the cross. Verses 12 and 13. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. In the ancient world, the bull was an embo of brutal strength that trampled and gored those who came before it. And because the land of Bashan was known to have such fertile pasture land, the bulls that fed upon it grew fat and large and strong. And David knew what it was like to be encircled by wild bulls of Bashan. He knew what it was like to have Absalom, Ahithophel, and the majority of the nation, overwhelming majority of the nation, encircle him so as to kill him. He knew what that was like. And at the cross were both Jewish rulers who conspired against Jesus along with Roman soldiers who facilitated his execution. So here the enemies of the Messiah are depicted as, verse 12, bulls, and verse 13, lions. Now this may, I think, I think most explicitly, this relates to Jesus' human persecutors, but I want to throw out a possibility. This may have application beyond solely Jesus' human persecutors. Because when Jesus was arrested, you remember that when the chief priests, the captains of the temple, and the elders came for him, he said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you in the temple daily, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Luke 22, verses 52 to 53. And the power of darkness. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, says that spiritual hosts of wickedness are the rulers of the darkness of this age. Furthermore, remember who entered into Judas Iscariot to instigate Jesus' arrest. Satan did. Luke 22, verse 3. I say all that to say this verse may have broader reference even beyond Jesus' earthly persecutors to describe the demons that potentially surrounded Jesus while he was at the cross. It's maybe some of the same demons he contended with during his earthly ministry. But whatever assault came at him at the cross, he triumphed over it. Colossians 2.15 says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. And where did that happen? At the cross. That is where Jesus not only canceled the debt that was against us and paid for our sins, it was also the place of Jesus' glorious triumph over all of the demonic hosts. You can imagine the legions of demons. You can imagine the possibility of this. 
them imagining that this was their greatest day of triumph. But just as Haman prepared a gallows for Mordecai, not realizing that he would be hung upon it himself, so the Satan-instigated betrayal of Jesus led to the disarmament of powers and principalities and the triumph of God's plan of redemption. Verse 14 continues the depiction of Christ's sufferings. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it has melted within me. So the expression, verse 14, I am poured out like water, describes a feeling of total exasperation. This feeling of being completely and utterly spent. You can imagine David with everything that he went through during the course of his life feeling like that. But we don't know of a time during David's life where he could have said these words. All of my bones are out of joint. It was prophesied that not one of the Messiah's bones would be broken. Psalm 34 verse 20. Just as the bones of the Passover lamb was not to be broken. Exodus chapter 12 verse 46. But that doesn't mean his bones couldn't have been out of joint. Rather, they likely were out of joint, exactly as the text tells us they would be. When somebody was crucified on a cross, their legs would be in a kind of 45 degree angle. And what they would do to breathe, they would have to, for the duration of time that they were on the cross, use their legs to hold themselves up. If you even try standing up, putting your legs in a 45 degree angle, putting them together and then holding them in a 45 degree angle, you could see how quickly your legs would get fatigued. So however long a person could hold themselves up by their legs, they could breathe better. But when their legs gave out, all the pressure would then fall upon their shoulders and their arms. And it wouldn't be uncommon then with all the weight then put upon their shoulders and their arms and their elbows and their wrists, that their shoulders and elbows and wrists would become disjointed. What a picture of another aspect of the suffering of our Savior. All his bones being out of joint. The account continues in verse 15 where we read, My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. Pot shirt, think, i.e., broken pot. Something brittle. Something easily broken. And my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. The picture is one of sapped strength and agonizing thirst. And we know that before Jesus died... He said the words, I thirst, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. John chapter 19, verse 28. Now the scripture that might be the scripture that he had in mind to be fulfilled appears to be Psalm 69, verse 21. But secondarily, note I'm saying secondarily, I think that the reality also bears witness to the prophetic truthfulness of his thirst as depicted right here. In Psalm 22, verse 15. Verse 16, For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. And again we see the Messiah's enemies depicted as animals, this time as unclean dogs. Now interestingly, I'll throw out a possibility here. Since dogs was a way in which Jewish people often referred to Gentiles, the dogs that are surrounding the Messiah here, I think are Gentile Roman dogs. That was a common designation since a dog was an unclean animal to refer to Gentiles. And I say that not only because of that parallel, but because of the witness of the second half of this verse. They pierced my hands and my feet. So leaving aside the potential textual questions, questions with this portion of the verse, we'll simply address it as every... Uh, as it's rendered in every major translation. They pierced my hands and my feet. Now, we've been studying through the life of David for quite a while in First and Second Samuel. We have a lot of narrative to consider, and we can never see a time when David's hands and feet were pierced. In fact, David, prophetically, the Son of God, apparently speaking through David, seems to be bearing witness of a form of execution that was not even invented during the time in which David was writing this. Crucifixion was a form of execution that was invented by the Persians around 400 to 300 B.C. So you would ask the question that would go something like this. How did David know that? What was he seeing? 
Or what was the Holy Spirit speaking to him to write down? He's bearing witness of an event that is going to happen a thousand years later. An event that is about 600, maybe even 700 years away from the invention of the form of execution that is being described right here. Incredible. Verse 17. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. So likely as a result of his pain, the way in which his body was contorted on the cross, the result of whatever disjointing occurred, and perhaps in some measure, as some commentators suggest, his emaciation, the Messiah was cognizant of all his bones. And while he was aware of them, people were looking and staring at him. It's horrible to suffer in private, but the shame, nakedness, and degradation, degradation of Jesus was accentuated by the fact that he was hung out for all to see. We see that here in verse 17, and in Luke 23, verse 35, we were told that people stood by watching. Watching. Among the staring were the soldiers who were engaged in dividing. Verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now again, a lot of narrative in the Bible about the life of David. And we can't think of a time when David had his clothing casted lots for, or his garments divided. Amazing. David is speaking as a prophet. And through the spirit of the Messiah, he describes the literal event that would occur 1,000 years later. The record of which we see in John's Gospel. So Psalm 22, verse 18, They divide my garments, and for my clothing they cast lots. Two things are happening. We'll talk about that in a minute. John 19, verses 23 through 24 read, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things." Notice what's happening in, in specific fulfillment of the psalm. Two things. Not just one thing is happening. Two things. A, they divide Jesus' garments. So when they divide Jesus' garments, meaning things likely like his belt and his sandals, that's likely what's referred to there, there was enough for them to divvy up among the four soldiers who were expediting Jesus' crucifixion and execution. That was one part of the prophetic witness of the psalm. But then they would cast lots, which John said they did because there was a tunic that was in one seam. And they didn't want to waste that. If they ripped it up, it would be no good for anybody. So they said, let us cast lots for it. And while they're doing it, they are likely completely ignorant of the fact that God said a thousand years ago, this very thing is going to happen. You're going to divide up his garments, belt, sandals, things like that for the four of you. And then you're going to cast lots for his clothes. The fingerprints of the Messiah are unmistakable in the prophetic witness of Scripture. Both of those aspects of verse 18 were fulfilled. Now, verses 19 through the first half of 21, But you, O Yahweh, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. So in the midst of the pain, the counting of the bones, the thirsting, the division of the garments, etc., there is still trust-inspired petitioning. Verse 19 is similar to the petition of verse 11, accented by Yahweh's identification of the sufferer's strength as the sufferer's strength. Now according to Jesus' humanity, Yahweh was his strength. Right? Jesus was fully man as well as fully God. So according to Jesus' humanity, Yahweh was his strength. And he called upon him to hasten his deliverance. Second half of verse 19, beginning of verse 20. Now when the psalmist said, Deliver from the sword, 
it's worth noting that there are at least two reasons why we should understand that to be a figurative expression. Two reasons. One within the passage, and another outside the passage. At least two reasons. One, because David has used that expression in his life, and David's the author of the psalm, and David has used that expression to denote a violent death without a sword. So David used that expression to express and communicate a violent death without a sword. So, for example, 2 Samuel chapter 11, in verse 24, he told the messenger to tell Joab when the messenger came and said that Uriah the Hittite had died because he was struck by arrows. David said, go tell Joab, quote, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and now another. The idea being, well, Uriah died via arrows, but David is using the expression of a sword to just express a violent death. So furthermore, within this very passage, the language of the sword is found in a string of metaphors. Deliver me from the power of the dog, save me from the lion's mouth, and from the horns of the wild oxen. Multiple metaphors describing his enemies and his executioners. That's why we would think the sword here is figurative, whereas past things we've interpreted as literal, for those two reasons at least. But then, in the second half of verse 21, the psalm suddenly turns. It suddenly turns. Verse 21, second half, You have answered me. This is the turning point. The suffering servant was not the indefinitely forsaken servant. In his suffering, he did not sin. He prayed, he trusted, he waited, and he was vindicated. And the suffering was successful. It appears that the Messiah now turns his attention prophetically through David. It's as though he turns his attention to the fulfillment of the sacrificial work in his being rejoined to communion with the Father by saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and then looks ahead to his forthcoming resurrection. I think that's hinted at in verse 22. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. So now the psalm of lament is turned. You have answered me. The suffering servant, not the indefinitely forsaken servant. And as a result of God's answering... Verse 21, the psalmist and prophetically the Messiah burst forth into praise even as there are calls for others to praise. Briefly, look at verse 23. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify Him and fear Him, all you offspring of Israel. And you can see the reason for the praise in verse 24. Verse 24, For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. The sacrificial work was being accomplished, even at that moment. So you can see now that there are calls forth of praise in verse 23 a reason for it in verse 24, but then it also looks to be that the praise is to spread beyond the borders of Israel into the nations. Verses 27 and 28. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for the kingdom is the Lord's and He rules over the nations. Incredible. Without going through those verses that seem to depict... The transition from the suffering on the cross to its completed, it is finished work to the resurrection and to the result of which after Jesus' ascension into heaven that there would be a church that would be comprised not only of Jews but of Jews and Gentiles. All nations would be gathered to worship Him. I hone in now in closing to verse 22. So while this verse does not explicitly say resurrection, it appears to be what's in view. I say that because while the Messiah says, Psalm 22, verse 22, I will declare your name to my brethren. That title, brethren, is one that we do not see Jesus specifically identify his disciples with during his earthly ministry. He would teach his disciples to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, but we don't see him specifically identify them as my brethren, 
until after the resurrection. And after the resurrection, we read in Matthew 28, verse 10, speaking to the women, he said, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. He likewise told Mary Magdalene, Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. My brethren. So I think Psalm 22, verse 22 gives us a hint of the Messiah's looking forward to what he was going to do post-resurrection, that he would declare the praise of his Father in the midst of his brethren. brethren. And we should remember that this is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, which is a reminder to us that Jesus had been made in, any way, in every way like us, and it was fitting for him to suffer so that he might become the captain of our salvation. And for this reason, that he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are one, he is not ashamed to even call us brethren. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. And his instruction, both by example and exhortation, is found in verses 23 and 24 of the psalm. Fear the Lord and glorify him. Fear the Lord and glorify Him. Well, that is a little over two-thirds of the psalm of the cross. And hopefully you are furnished with more reasons to worship and adore your Savior who suffered for you in ways that are hard for us to imagine, very difficult for us to imagine, but at least Psalm 22 gives us a little bit more of an inkling towards the depth of His suffering for us so that by repentance and faith alone in His person and work, we could be forgiven and called brethren. Called brethren. Let's pray. Father, and thank You for the text of Psalm 22. I thank You for the witness and the description that we have of the sufferings of our Savior. I pray, Heavenly Father, that You would help this Word to be hidden well in our hearts and that we would treasure it and that we would look upon it, however often you would lead us to it, so that we might be humbled afresh, and we might be in awe afresh of the veracity and the infinite wisdom that you have and declare and reveal through the text of Scripture, and that we might see, with a little bit of clearer lenses, the suffering of our Savior, so that we might magnify and extol Him. We love you, Lord. And thank you for this morning that we have together to yet again study your Word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.